We want to thank you for coming to our session. My name is Howard Chain, and I'm doing this program with Megan O'Brien, who is to my left, and Dr. James Source, who is sitting here as well. Megan and I will do most of the speaking, but Jim made considerable contributions, as did so many others. In your ASHA information sheet, when we first submitted this proposal last spring, we were continuing to develop our proposal. At the time, we referred to it as Say It With Pictures and have evolved into Visual Immersion Program, or the VIP. And it's a program that is growing out of the work we're doing in the Autism Language Program at Children's Hospital Boston. Part of our work is sponsored by the RERC on Communication Enhancement. That's the virtual RERC with a number of other centers and individuals in our field. And we think there's a lot of really great work going on in the RERC, and we certainly want to uh, point out the sponsorship uh, for this lecture. While the three of us have certainly contributed to this undertaking, there are a number of others who have made valuable contributions as well especially the children and the parents who graciously bring their children to us and give us the opportunity to try and help them out. But we learn so much from them. We have some outreach programs in the Boston Public Schools called the Model Autism Program. And there's also a program at the Monarch School in Cleveland, Ohio, and a number of individuals, including Marie Duggan, who happens to be here today as well, who contribute so much to our center. What we want to do today is overview the VIP, knowing that the VIP is a comprehensive program that is intended to enhance language both as an expressive and as a receptive uh, opportunity. We're convinced that the importance of comprehension is sometimes overlooked by programs intended to teach individuals on the autism spectrum. Uh, in other words, their focus is often on expression, and we actually think that that ought to be reversed. I'm going to review some of the key components of the VIP, and then we'll describe teaching concepts that we know are difficult for individuals with moderate to severe autism uh, to learn, and then we'll show you how we approach this using this particular approach. We'll show you a number of clinical examples as well, we will have an opportunity to see different children and adolescents reacting or responding to the principles that we'll be describing before we show you the actual uh, videos. The goal of the VIP is to use visual supports in everyday situations to teach communication, not just in the therapy room, not just in the classroom, but in every situation. There are uh, some key ingredients that uh, I want to point out that, again, um, keep in mind it's important uh, to see that it impacts both comprehension and expression. We see it as a closed language system in that it has restrictive pragmatics and will target just some basic communication operations, which I'll review. Both the, the instructor, who we sometimes refer to as the mentor, and the learners exposed to our program will use the same visuals to communicate to one another. It is a combination, but we're targeting comp comprehension today. Also, we believe, based on some survey work that we have reported on in the past and are continuing to explore, and something that you may already know, that persons on the autism spectrum have a very strong attraction to electronic screen media. In our survey, for example, we found that video, DVD, computer screens were in some cases the most important form of entertainment. Sometimes more time was spent watching electronic media than all other forms of media combined. And we've been convinced for some time that if a person spends that much time looking at a computer screen or looking at a video, that there must be something inherent in that material that we want to take advantage of and that we can then use to encourage the person not just to be entertained, but also to learn. In other words, to improve those language concepts that elude us so often by using electronic media. So what is visual immersion? We're talking about an environment 
where it's a responsive environment that takes advantage of, of visual supports we know are useful. We didn't invent visual supports. People like you, professionals, teachers, speech-language pathologists, have come to the realization that visual schedules, visuals for communication, can make a significant difference for those individuals who have such significant communication deficits. But also the environment can be responsive, so we want to establish and create an environment that enables the person to benefit from the visuals to improve their ability to understand what's going on around them. It needs to be done in the home, in the school, and in the community. We don't, all ha we don't have all the answers. We're just getting better at trying to make it a universally applied instructional format. We want the person on the autism spectrum to have easy access not only to the electronic media, but also to non-electronic forms of expression, comprehension, and just understanding and helping the individual with transitions and so forth. I mentioned earlier that we have isolated seven communicative operations. Protesting and refusal. Well, we don't need to teach many children how to protest. We do want to teach them to use more symbolic means of doing that. And requesting. We'll certainly see some demonstration examples of that. That's certainly an important part of the PECS program, which everybody seems to know about these days. You're going to see us using the TLC, the TLC within the VIP is to give directive and also to be able to comment. As we move along, we have strategies for questions, social conventions, and also for transitions. One of our focuses will be on comments and also the directives. What the VIP is not. It is not meant to teach abstract concepts with liberty and justice for all, for example, or teach the passive voice, complex syntactic structures, figurative language or humor. However, we feel that being able to better understand spoken language, a language that is being tr transmitted visually or spoken, sets the stage or creates a way of being able to learn and essentially launch the ability to benefit from these more complex functions. We all know this. I know my mom used to say, don't comment on the obvious. I might have spent my whole life doing that, but as practicing speech and language pathologist, we learned what we do needs to be generalized to the natural environment. In helping with daily routines, operational knowledge, it's amazing sometimes how well individuals on the spectrum understand what's happening around them, what's happening in their environment. They know how to operate their VCR, know how to make lunch, they know how everything in the house operates, and they've learned this all through observation and it's a visual opportunity. But when we impose, or when we begin to impose language on them, that's when they sometimes break down, and that's why their operational understanding is considerable. We also want to be able to use our information in a preferred play routine. As a practicing speech-language pathologist, we also do many things on the tabletop, and you'll see some of the instruction on the tabletop, but also there's the virtual setting using the electronic media to help them understand. So again, it's not just entertainment, it's more edutainment. Using something that attracts them for reasons we don't always quite understand. It's a tremendous magnet. It pulls them in. So of course we're saying, what can we do to make this opportunity to learn, or to make them, or to improve the opportunity to learn? This is what I mean. We all do work in the natural environment, we all do work on the tabletop, and now maybe the addition is to the virtual setting. Some children do better when they are exposed to things on a tabletop. Some do it better in, with, when it's presented to them in a virtual way. So when you personalize, it has to depend on the individual. Here's an example of a natural school setting. Uh, there's Mike with his teacher, and they're using something we call a mobile language display, or MLD which is basically Velcro adhered adherence for activities in the classroom. Mike is being given instruction. Some people refer to it as aided language or augmented input. And we're giving him information to be able to improve his ability to understand that particular routine. You're going to meet the ALP family. That's capital A, capital L, capital P. These are, the, these are materials we've been creating that gives us the ability to demonstrate the families that come to see us at Children's Hospital, 
uh, ways of teaching some of these language concepts and also giving them some materials that they can take away. We'll get to those in a moment. There's a family and there's some other objects that are readily available that are used in doing some of these tabletop activities. Here's an example of a virtual setting. Some examples here uh, from something called the Great Action Adventure. Some of you know the Mirror Johnson again symbols, again to demonstrate climbing. Again, the react. The here we have a homemade video, and here's Kara doing some climbing. She's also going to be a. Here we have an example of an extremely popular character, and as we all know, video is important. If we can just capture those concepts, which are so elusive by being able to get a video content, then we can also demonstrate the concept of climbing. So if we take advantage of that uh, opportunity to teach children uh, it, that represents the concept, we think this is a, um, an important way to get this, this idea across. That's what we're going to demonstrate in the TLC. How can that type of dynamic scene to do something that is so interesting, and then apply it to more generic language. Just quickly, communication should be easy. What do I mean? I mean that if we want to make the distinction between just making a communicative statement where a child says something, asks something, and we accept it and move on, we want to be able to do that in an easy way. We want to separate that from language arts where we are focused on teaching specific language concepts. Every communicative situation, every time a child communicates, it shouldn't be necessarily an opportunity to expand their language, to make it more than what it was intended to be. Not that I'm suggesting that we don't want to do that, but let's at least understand that we need to draw that distinction. Make communication easy, and at, some, at times, it certainly makes sense to be able to uh, introduce uh, a teaching opportunity. Now, as for visual supports, most language instruction programs working with people on the autism spectrum do use visual supports. We recognize that. We honor that. Why are visuals needed? Because of comprehension or auditory processing problems that people with severe to moderate to severe autism experience, um, and we have data to support that, they respond favorably to visual supports. Now, you know, you can't always separate comprehension from auditory processing. The use of the visual is an alternative modal modality. And again, you're taking advantage of their relative strength. We like to use the term sustained presence. There's something about having the visual continue to appear that gives the person, let's say the person with an auditory processing impairment, the ability to then process or to understand what's being presented because of its sustained presence. Maybe that's one reason why visuals are so important. It's the, it is that sustained presence. Several surveys have, have demonstrated or, uh, or shown that uh, an estimated 50% of people on the um, autism spectrum are non-speaking. We as, the profession, as professionals have made augmentative communication important as it is. So the work we're doing with persons with autism is really the work of, of the individual who's working in AAC. Symbol representations. Here we're going to talk about level of representation. We we know about the, these kinds of materials. We call these 3D photos. And we find that for some individuals, we have to capture the level at which they are understanding these materials. And what we may not have used before are these 3D photos. What we do is cut out the photo and cut out the background. Then we mount it on foam board or cardboard to give it a more three-dimensional look. Quite often, it makes a difference in some some individuals being able to understand what the material is really trying to represent or what that symbol represents. We know photographs sometimes works. Sometimes line drawing works. Sometimes colored photos work. But for some individuals, the 3D photo makes a significant difference. Types of representations. 
we use what we call scene cues, element cues, and manual signs and gestures. We're going to focus on scene and element cues in this discussion today. A scene cue is a perceptual representation, and it's a symbol which illustrates an entire event. It captures the essence of what you um, want or expect the individual to do. Just hold that thought for a moment, and we'll show you some examples. It captures the essence of what is expected. And there are two types of scene cues. They can be dynamic, or they can be static. This is an example of a dynamic scene cue, and this is using some materials that come from our Alp family. Uh, this is um, Mr. Alp's car. The car pushes the block. Uh, in the video, the car pushes the block. We also try to have the materials act in ways they normally wouldn't act. So, uh, you give a child a car and a little figurine, and the child is going to put the figurine in the car. But we want to expand on that. So it's really not based on routine and expectation. It's based on the actual language of what is being shown. So in this case, you heard it, but you also saw it. Now here's an example of a static scene cue. So in the ALP program, you can use these dynamic scenes, but you can also use static scenes where there are quite a few graphics which are printable. You can switch between the dynamic and the static as well. And then there are elements. Those of you familiar with the Folks Sentence Builder, an old language teaching program, which uh, is kind of based on semantic relations, um, we'll see the relationship between those programs and what we're trying to do here. We borrowed heavily from that, uh, that idea. But the idea is that agents... Actions and objects um, are taught. This is the hard stuff, the spatial relations and the attributes and the, and the action verbs. Person on the spectrum tend to do very well with nouns. It's when you get to the more relational or con connectors of language, that's when we start to see breakdown. Here are some examples of element cues, agents, actions, and objects. Uh, these are all uh, included in your handout. If we're doing elements, but this time representing it with text, obviously um, you, you, you would use whole words, and that's what's contained here. Symbolate is an interesting concept. Symbolate is the concept of stringing concepts together through a series of isolated symbols. Many of you, as you're in your role as a speech-language pathologist, don't, don't always uh, know what this says but we believe that it doesn't actually improve comprehension just because you string symbols together and throw visuals at somebody. They need to have some prior knowledge of language element and semantic relations in order to benefit, even if you are going to use them as, as complex a sentence as what you see here. We believe paradoxically, paradoxically, while you're trying to improve comprehension, the introduction of this kind of string of symbols could in fact impair comprehension or get in the way of comprehension. Types of displays. A visual scene display here with the concept of hotspots. There are a lot of work in the RERC, there's been a lot of work in the RERC, in a paper that came out in Augmentative Communication uh, News, uh, Sarah Blackstone's newsletter, which was the result of a lot of um, thinking. We all know about grid displays. When I say grids, I mean the traditional communication displays. The grid, grid where you put symbols within targets. The visual scene is a growing phenomenon, if you will, within our profession. We're using whole scenes as a way of communicating or describing in information where there are hot spots. And so you touch something within a scene and something happens. Here's an example of a program um, that we developed in the mid-90s called Companion. The idea here is that there's this village, and I have hotspots. I click on the house, and it takes me to another representation. And when I click on the bed, it takes me to the bedroom. I can navigate down. 
There's some work done by Janice Light that, that shows that this kind of representation may be more meaningful to individualize uh, to individuals than decontextualized information that's presented in a grid. It's something to think about, especially for younger children, and that's what uh, uh, Janice Light's research has demonstrated. It seems to be um, more intuitive and more understandable. Here's another way to uh, create a visual scene. Take a, uh, rather than take a photograph, say, of, a, of a, back, a box of macaroni and putting it into a target area, take an entire picture uh, like this from a pantry and you have the important food items already made for you. Here's a typical example of grids. These are grids arranged by category. They are obviously about food. Here's a conversational grid display with subjects and verbs and so forth. We're going to see more of that later. Here's an example of a mobile language display. Here's Mike working with his teacher, and I'm going to set this up. So he's going to be, say that he wants to, what he wants to do, and he's going to go to a ring toss activity where he has to put a particular color ring into a particular bin so there's a number on it. And if you watch Mike, who's doing very well with language comprehension, when he has these visual supports, you'll see him continuously referring back to the visual because it's giving him the information he needs to keep going. Craig, his teacher, is using a mobile language display to get him to orient it and keep him focused on the task so that we're successful uh, when we're having uh, this interaction. First, you ready? Let's go. Hey, Mike. Let's three. Our teaching language concepts program is essentially a visual instruction system used for teaching language concepts which are particularly challenging for people with moderate to severe autism, including verbs, prepositions, and attributes. It is a confined visual language which simply means that it is limited to the essential vocabulary and syntax needed to support everyday functional communication exchanges. Most typically, instruction is going to begin in the virtual environment using engaging video observational learning materials and then instruction progresses to the tabletop environment using manipulative materials and finally extends to the natural environment, hopefully ultimately resulting in functional communication at home, in school, and in the community. In our Teaching Language Concepts program, the learner is going to progress through all or some of the three phases of visual language instruction, beginning with the most concrete and ending with the most abstract representations. Depending on the learner's needs and abilities, instruction can begin at any of these levels. We typically begin at the dynamic scene cue level. These are full motion video clips of action scenes. 
Then we progress to static scene cues, which are photographs that capture a prototypical moment in the action scene. Finally, we would end with language element cues, which are graphic icons representing each of the individual parts of speech, like subject, object, verb, preposition, adjective, etc. In our program, we are using a unique integration of video-based observational learning with scene and element cues to promote language comprehension and expression. I'm going to show you some different examples of these dynamic scene cues and remind you of what they are. This is an example of a dynamic scene cue representing the concept climb. You'll see Kermit climbing the ladder in a video. Climb. Kermit climbs ladder. A lot of the individuals we're working with have spent some time working with this dynamic scene foundation. We present them with the identical materials on the tabletop and they would be presented with the video clip and would be required to reenact what they see happening on the screen. Then we're going to progress to the static scene cue, which again are these photographs representing the prototypical moment in an action scene. So this photograph represents Kermit climbs the ladder and the learner would be expected to report the meaning in the photograph. Finally, we progress to the element cues, which represent the different com components within the sentence, Kermit climbs ladder. Again, we're focusing here on this concept of climb, which is challenging for some persons with autism. Now I think it's most appropriate to show you how we implement the materials with our learners using video examples. I'll begin with dynamic scene cues. This is Ryan. He is 9 years, 10 months old, and he has autism. In terms of his language comprehension, he is primarily following routine-based directions and responding to context rather than spoken language. Expressively, he's using speech primarily for requesting, and he frequently exhibits scripted language. In this video, you'll see him presented with complex multi-element sentences and he won't execute the directives. Then he's presented with a dynamic scene cue and you'll notice he reacts immediately to the scene and reenacts the scene he's observing. He does have some obsessive compulsive behaviors, so he matches the little objects exactly to what he's seeing in the video. This is Ryan. Ryan, I want you to have Kermit push the girl in the wheelchair. Push. Have Kermit push the girl in the wheelchair. Ryan, Ryan, look. Can you have the girl push the dog in the wheelchair? Ryan, have the girl push the dog in the wheelchair. Ryan, look. I now want to show you an example of someone who is using static scene cues. Once again, those photographs representing a concrete concept. This is Avery. He's 10 years, 9 months old. 
In terms of language comprehension, he follows contextual single-step routine-based commands. He's communicating about 10 spoken word approximations. He's been introduced to the Picture Exchange Communication System for requesting. In this video, you'll see him presented with static scene-based cues and he'll recreate each. You'll notice that a lot of the cues he's presented with represent an action, so he's inferring the movement from the photograph. In one of the examples, he actually goes to seek out information from the visual scene. So the spoken directive is presented and he looks to find where the visual information is to support his comprehension of the spoken directive. Have Kermit push the fire truck. Yeah, have Kermit push the fire truck. Yeah, there you go. Can you put the bed on top of the bowl? Can you put the bed on top of the bowl? Put the bed on the bowl. Avery, do it. Put the bed on the bowl. Mm -hmm. Can you put the bed in the bowl? Can you put the bed in the bowl? Put that in the bowl. There you go. Can you put the dog on the bowl? On the cheating. <laughs> put the bed on put the dog on the bowl. dog on the ball. We typically spend quite a bit of time with learners at the dynamic and the static levels. Next I wanted to present how we would transition between the dynamic, which is the most concrete representation of the event, to the static level, which is that photographic representation. This is Iman, who is five years, ten months old, and she's able to imitate dynamic scene cues. She's great at that. So we're working on getting her to understand how to infer meaning from static scene cues, how you infer push when the object is actually pushing and not just leaning as it appears in the photograph. In this clip, you'll see her using a static scene cue successfully. Then she'll be presented with another static scene cue and won't quite understand the concept, so we go back to the dynamic to support her understanding of the task. And then we model the association between the visuals to get her to understand that the static is a representation of the dynamic. Right up here, me. Can you make the boy stand on the ball? Oh, yeah. He's kicking the ball. He's kicking. Make the boy stand on the ball. So immediately she understands the dynamic scene cue and then we model the association between the static and the dynamic. Unfortunately that wasn't captured in the video clip. Next is Neil who is five years eight months old and you'll first see him using scene cues to follow directions like you've seen in previous clips. Then he'll be presented with an array of scene cues and an action will be performed at the tabletop. He'll be required to match the scene cue to the action he sees being performed. Can you have Woody push the car? Yeah, you do. <laughs> you do it. Woody. 
You do it. Good boy. Okay. Now Neil. Neil. There we go. There's Woody. And there's Gumby. And there's Batman. Now tell me. Neil, tell me. Look at Who's pushing? Tell me. Tell me. Good, Good boy. Oh. That's right. That Batman's pushing the car. Okay, Neil. Look at Neil. Look, Neil. Tell me. Tell me. Who's pushing the car? Who's pushing the car? That's yeah. good boy. That's yeah. right. Yeah. That Woody's pushing the car. All right, one more. One more. All right. Look at You want in? Okay. okay. One more. All right, one more. Push. Who's doing it now? Tell me. Who's pushing the car, Neil? Neil? Find the picture. Who's pushing the car? Give me the picture. That's right. Gumby's pushing the car. Tell me something. Neil. Neil. This is bad man. Okay. You do it, yeah. Mommy. Mm -hmm. Have him climb. Yep. Yeah. Neil. Neil. You, which one? Which one? Which one, Neil? Look at Who's climbing? Who's climbing? Show me. Who's climbing? That's right. Yeah. Batman. Batman is climbing. That's right. Yeah. Now, Neil. Can you tell me <coughs> which one, Neil? Which one, Neil? Which one? Which one? Look at mommy. Oh, yeah. Which one? Yeah. Look, Neil. Look at. Which one? Who's which climbing? One? That's right. Woody. Woody's Woody. what? Tell me the sentence. Woody. Woody. Yeah. Climbing. Climbing. Yeah. All right. You want to take a break? Yeah. Let's take a break. Next is a clip of Courtney, who is communicating primarily using single word utterances. This element cues task is presented to promote his ability to communicate lengthier utterances and to use more various parts of speech to describe. He's been presented with an element cues task for comprehension and now is required to describe an action using these element cues. What's this? Uh, I'll look at what? Thumbby? In, in the what? Uh, Which picture? In the what? Uh, put it right here. Now tell me the whole thing. Tell me. That's correct. Now, what about now? Tell me now. Make fix the sentence. Zombie. Put it over here. Now tell me the sentence. That's right. Zombie's in the bed. That's great. Now, tell me something now. You know what this says? Push. Now watch. Ready? Watch. What's happening here? Tell me with a sentence. Gumby. Gumby. Put it right here. Gumby what? Gumby what? Gumby what? Push. Which picture? Which one? Push. Okay, put it over there. Good. All right, tell me the whole sentence now. Tell me. That's right. Nice job. Now tell me. Belong. 
That's right. Nice job. Next, we have Peter, who is presented with a very similar task. He's been successful with the same task as Courtney, uh, which you saw in the previous clip using the picture-based element cues. Peter is currently working toward using the text-based element cues to describe, as you'll see in the clip. Ready? What's happening? Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Tell me what the pit with the words. Woody, go ahead. Tell me what you were doing and starting to do. Go ahead. Put it right up here. Woody. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So tell me. Woody. Very good. That's really very good. Hey, what's going on here? Come, come. Remove that. Okay, now tell me. Come, Lee. Yeah. Copy. 
be the best track. Very good. Thank you so much. Okay. Very good. The next thing we're going to discuss is how to get an individual from the scene cue level to the element cue level. Just like Iman's clip transitioning from the dynamic to the static, what we do is present the most abstract type of representation, which would be the element cues, and fade back to the static cues as needed. Regan is 18 years old uh, and responds best, uh, is responding to routine-based familiar directions. He communicates using speech and frequently exhibits echolalia. He communicates a lot physically um, using gestures to indicate requests. So this is an example. Regan's been working with the static scene cue level for several weeks, and we're just beginning to present him with element cues. Regan, can you put the man behind the cup? The man? Mm -hmm. The man behind the cup. And the cup? Yep. We're going to do behind. So the man behind the cup. Let me show you what that would look like. The man behind the cup. Like this. Perfect. Yep. Behind the cup. Behind in the cup. Yeah. Behind the cup. Behind in the cup. Right. Can you put the ball in the bag? In, in the bag. Perfect. Good job. You put the girl on the block. In the block. The girl on the block. On the block. Mm -hmm. Block. In the block. That's right. On the block. You put, that's right. You put the ball on the block. I want you to put the girl on the Block. Um, the block. On. On. The block. Mm -hmm. Yep. You put her next to the block. Why don't you put her on, like this, Regan? And the kiss. Girl on the block. We'll do the kiss next. Put the girl on the block. On the block. Like this. Huh. Let's do this. Good. Girl on the block. block. Yes. The block. That's right. On the block. That's right. You did a good job. We're going to do on again. This time we're going to put the boy on the ball. Boy on the ball. Boy, 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 mm -hmm. on the ball. Very good. Just like that. The boy's on the ball. Good for you. On the ball. Boy on the ball. Okay. Can you make... Can you put the man on the ball? The man on the ball. Mm -hmm. Now put the man on the block. On the block. Mm -hmm. On the block. Mm -hmm. Very good. Now put the woman on the block. Woman. Mm -hmm. Block. Woman on the block. Woman on the block. Very good. We're finding it's challenging to transition from the scene cues to the element cues, so currently what we're doing is introducing something called a mixed display, where we have the static scene cue paired with the element cues to really point out the associations between the two types of visuals. 
Progressing from the dynamic scene cues to the static scene cues tends to be relatively easy in terms of our observations to date. The transition from static scene cues to element cues is relatively challenging. But we would hope that the payoff is worth it because we want to build the foundation for generative language. And our ultimate goal is for learners to combine these language element cues with their knowledge of semantic relations for generating novel sentences for requesting, directing, commenting, asking questions across a variety of settings at home, at school, and in the community. This is an example of how we would combine those language elements in a conversational display in a more naturalistic manner. Conversational displays are also known as topic displays, which is a communication grid display arranged by agent, action, and object. It can be either electronic or non-electronic. Typically, a lot of our conversational displays that we're using consist of removable symbols with an, with an accumulator window. The learner can observe how the elements combine to generate full sentences. When we're using conversational displays, we're using a lot of modeling of the utterances. We're using two-way interactions to promote back and forth communication between the learner and mentor. We're using these displays during highly motivating activities with the child or adult we're working with um, who might be motivated to communicate, for example, during playground, bubbles, swimming, etc. Instruction may begin with a series of object elements, so preferred objects that the learner is requesting, we would gradually add action elements and agent elements as the learner becomes successful. Finally, we would add adjectives, prepositions, and comments. This is an example of a conversational display for a bubbles activity. Agents are on the left, uh, we have actions here, attributes, prepositions, and then comments at the end. And our accumulator window is at the top. This is an example of using a conversational display. This is Charlie. He's three years, nine months old. When this clip was taken, he was speaking primarily to request, and he had been introduced to a picture exchange communication system for requesting. This clip demonstrates how we can use visuals to get these kids directing and commenting and communicating for more pragmatic purposes. This is, wait, this is Charlie. Charlie, do you want to pop or do you want to blow? Blow. Blow? I want to blow. Pop bubbles. Okay. Whoa. That was a big bubble. A big bubble. It's my turn. It's Megan's turn. Megan's turn. Megan's turn. Megan. Megan. Blow. Big. Bubble. Let's read it together. Megan. Blow. Big. Bubbles. Okay. Get ready. Are you going to pop it? I'll pop it. Do you want another one? Another one. Another one. Another one. Whoa! Hey. Hi. Hi. Hello. Whose turn is it now? Bubbles. Bubbles. We're going to do more bubbles. Is it Charlie's turn or Megan's turn? Megan's turn. Is Megan going to pop or blow? A blow. Blow. Little or big? A big. Big. Megan, blow, big. Bum, bum. <laughs> Here they come. Whoa. It popped in your face. Okay, Charlie, I'm going to let you move the pictures now. You tell me what you want to do. Can you sit up? Good job. There you go. Okay. Whose turn? Show me. Bubble. Bubbles. Move it up here. Good job. Bubbles. Do you want to blow or pop? A pop. I want to pop. I want to pop the bubbles. That's right. Where's your popping finger? A pop -up. Where's that finger? There it is. Pop those bubbles, Charlie. Pop them. They're everywhere. 
You're popping up. <laughs> Good job. Hey, Charlie, watch this one. Let's make the bubbles go up. Bubbles up. Up in the air. Bubbles! Go up. 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 Ready? Me. One, two. So that's an example of modeling expansion and enhancing the linguistic complexity of a child's message. Now I'd like to go back to the challenge I was speaking about earlier, transitioning from static to element cues. We're finding that not only are individuals with autism spectrum disorder experiencing difficulty reading these cues, but also typically developing children who aren't yet literate are experiencing difficulty. In this video clip, you'll see a typically developing five-year-old who is not yet reading, and she's having difficulty understanding, should I read symbols from right to left or left to right? A lot of the individuals we're working with are having difficulty inferring the meaning of the action element and the prepositional element that's at the center of these phrases. As Megan indicated, moving from the scene to the element queue is a real clinical challenge. If it was easy, would have, we would have done it long ago. After all, we've had preposition representations, adjective representation, and action representations from Mayor Johnson and other symbol sets for some time. We're trying to understand a way to make clearly uh, the teaching of these language concepts and how to do it more effectively. We're now looking at typical four, five, and six-year-old children to help us explore that question. We introduce it to these children without any language. The reason I mention no language because if I say to a typical five-year-old child who has language, um, have Gumby uh, climb the ladder or push the ball, they can do it. But if I try to introduce it just using visuals, uh, at times we see that there's a breakdown in comprehension. Placing things as Anna was doing in the video, it becomes more difficult. It begins to help us understand the difficulty that individuals on the autism spectrum have who also, of course, have language difficulties. In light of all this, we're using what we call buildable displays. Uh, so we're looking at using these buildable displays where we portray what, what the entire scene represents and then placing the elements under it. And we do this with typical developing children as models. We don't believe that the symbols that do exist represent prepositions and our actions uh, in a particularly effective way. So we also think that it's important that we, we try to better understand how to create some of these elements. We're going to continue to do that 
as well as trying to use typical children in our therapy sessions, as well as uh, in our therapy, I'm sorry, to, to introduce it to typical children to help us uh, learn better methods and also introduce it in our therapy ch- sessions with children who are on, on the autism spectrum. Trying to have a clinical model at our center so that we can better understand how to solve this very challenging problem is the direction that we'll continue to take at Children's Hospital Boston. We think it's the holy grail in terms of teaching language concepts to individuals on the, on the autism spectrum. We also believe that we're just really at the beginning of this. We've created a scope and a sequence that seems to have some merit, but uh, it's going to take some time and some research to really explore and and eventually report on whether or not our approach is effective or not. And, of course, we're trying to get at generative language. We say this because we take a program like PECS, or the Picture Exchange Communication System, we know that it's effective for teaching very early communication or requesting, but that's not enough. It uh, puts the, the ceiling on how far you can go if you only use PECS. And as a speech-language pathologist, we certainly need to understand that PECS is a good beginning, but we certainly need to go beyond that and not just create static, robotic and sentences um, as a way to ask for everything a person may want. We really need to teach a generative language, and we really believe that uh, that the direction that we're taking uh, can have an important um, uh, impact on our profession. Uh, on behalf of our team at Children's Hospital Boston, I want to thank you for um, attending this session.